Good evening. It's good for to see everyone here tonight. We're glad that you're able to come out and worship with us and uh, and enjoy a, a song service and prayer and and a study from from God's Word this evening. Want to remind you of a few announcements that we made this morning. Of course, we want to remember uh, Barry's family. Karen Hudson is under uh, hospice care, and Barry is out with her. So we want to remember them in our in our prayers. Uh, also, uh, Bill Langley will be having um, a procedure done on the 15th to, to look at the mass on his kidneys and, and find out, uh, they'll do a biopsy and find out about the, about the mass. Don and Rita Faulkner are not here, and they've, they uh, texted us and let us know that they're sick, not feeling well, so that explains um, their absence. This evening, George Piasari will lead us in our singing, Zachary um, McKegg will um, do the scripture reading. He'll be reading from James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. Randy Andrews will lead us in our opening prayer, and Dick Eaton will lead us in our closing prayer. So let's begin our services as Zachary will come forward and, and, and read. Tonight I'll be reading from James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work that you may, may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. It is good to be back again for our evening service. We shall sing two songs, and then we shall have our opening prayer. The first song is hymn number 231, Soldiers of Christ, Arise. We shall sing the first, the second, and then the last verse. Soldiers of Christ, Arise. <clears throat> Soldiers of Christ, Arise. shall sing all the three verses.
Pray with me if you could. Our Heavenly Father, as we humbly bow, we're so grateful for this opportunity. We can humbly bow before you to speak to you in this avenue of prayer where we can thank you for all the blessings that you bestow upon each of us. We're thankful, Father, for this another point of time where we can assemble together and we pray, Father, to worship you in spirit and in truth. We're so thankful, Father, for the country that we live in, for the many privileges and freedoms that we enjoy. And we pray, Father, that if it be your will, that these privileges may be extended for a very long period of time. We are reminded, Father, for those of our number here that are in need of our prayers, those that are undergoing cancer treatments and other ailments, and we pray for strength, Father, that they may have the necessary tools provided that they can uh, once again gain a measure of health where they can carry on their normal walks of life and if possible to be back in the assembly here today. We know there are some that are mourning the loss of loved ones and we pray that you will be with them and comfort them as only you can. We pray, Father, for peace in this world. We know there are uh, conflicts going on in Ukraine and we pray that soon, if it be your will, that peace may reign again and that your will, Father, may be definitely uh, in our lives as well. We realize, Father, from time to time we do sin, and we ask that you forgive us of our sins, that we may be right before you. Help us, Father, to realize our responsibility uh, before you and before our fellow man, understanding that many times we are the only Bible that the people around us will read. Help us, Father, that we can be the kind of light in this lost and dying world that you would be proud of, and we can serve you and your name be glorified. We pray, Father, that you continue to be with the elders and the deacons here at this congregation in Claremont, that you will help them to further the borders of thy kingdom here and throughout the world where we know they are participants and supporting other preachers, and we thank you so much, Father, for this endeavor. And we pray, Father, that your word and your will may be scattered throughout the world. I ask, Father, that everything that we say and do this evening may be pleasing to you, that we can say we worship you in spirit and in truth, and we ask that you be with the speaker of the hour, that he may be able to remember the things that he has studied and present them in a simple and understanding manner. Forgive us, Father, again when we sin. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Before our lesson, we shall sing hymn number 479. I know that my Redeemer lives. <clears throat> we shall see the first, second, and the last verse. I know my Redeemer
Well, good evening. It's good to see everyone this evening. I do want to give a special thank you to the congregation here in Claremont, uh, supporting uh, my family and the work over in Mount Dora, Eustis area. We, uh, we're we're, we're kind of in a different situation where we have actually been evicted from the place where we were renting. Eviction is always a harsh term. It's not like they just kicked us out to the curb, but uh, so we're in the process of finding another meeting location right now, but we're, we're doing really good and we appreciate the prayers. We are a people that has become obsessed with time and we want to get the most things done in the least amount of time. I was talking to the, uh, the hairdresser who cuts my hair and I haven't seen her for a while, obviously, but... Um, I used to go to Great Clips, nothing against Great Clips, it was right by the house, it was uh, the cheapest option, and uh, I would get a good haircut two out of three times. Those aren't the odds I'm looking for. Uh, and so, as I was talking about this to the hairdresser that I go to now, I, she said, yeah, you know why that is? And I said, no, she said, because in their training, they're timed. They have to be able to do this particular haircut in X amount of time. It's get people in, get people out. That's just how it is. And that's why, in general, workmanship has suffered greatly in the last several decades, not just with hair, but construction. I don't know if my house has a right angle. Uh, the restaurant industry, I mean, everything. It's more about quantity than quality. And uh, we're not in innocent either. You know, we're not innocent. We want more done in less time as well. For the average American family, more meals are being eaten on the run than around the dinner table. Uh, a, a degree that used to take you four years to earn, well, that can be shaved down now, sometimes significantly. In fact, uh, uh, when I taught at the, uh, at the Bible school in Mount Dora for a brief time, we had a student there that he graduated college before he graduated high school. I mean, that's just how crazy it is that you can cram everything in a short amount of time. But we're in a hurry, it just seems. The question is, what are we in a hurry for? At the end of your life, when you look back, you're going to wonder, why did I do so much rushing around? And Quite honestly, for some of us, when we do get into those older years, we're going to find that a lot of the health problems we have are because we rushed around way too much. Life is not a sprint. It's a marathon, so just pace yourself. Make sure you got enough gas to finish, uh, finish the race. But we're obsessed with time. I don't know if your house is like mine. We have a clock in every room. We have a clock in the bathroom. I don't know why. Uh, some here still wear watches, but even if you don't wear a watch, you pull out your cell phone, what's the first thing we see? Ah, what time it is. We're constantly reminded of what time it is. Uh, we just want to be reminded because we're in a hurry. You, you turn on your car, first thing that lights up, the time. But you know, God is not in a hurry. Now, I don't know if you recognize Flash up here. Uh, Flash is a sloth from the movie Zootopia, and he works at the DMV, very appropriate, uh, and he just takes his sweet time getting things done. And I'll tell you, essentially, our Lord does too. He's not in a hurry. He's not in a rush to get everything just checked off on the list. Living in this fast-paced world, it really has crippled us. It's crippled us because we are not learning patience. If we have to wait at the drive through window for longer than five minutes, we get agitated, don't we? Come on, what's this guy doing ahead of me? And we just blame everybody else. Uh, but God isn't in a hurry. And so we need to just sit down, take a deep breath, and appreciate the things around us and focus on the things that are truly important. Uh, I bet with most of us, the things that we wait impatiently for are the things that really don't matter in the grand scheme of things. We all need more patience. And we might pray for patience, but the problem is this is the prayer. Lord, grant me patience right now. That's how we ask for it. 
Isn't that one of the first things that we learn as a child, or we're supposed to learn, is patience? I know when my parents were talking to someone, and if I needed to ask them something, I had to wait until mom or dad was finished talking, and then I could ask them. And that's patience, because as a little kid, waiting in silence for a minute is, is just like an eternity. But if a child does not learn patience, they're not apt to learn much else, really. Think about school, reading, writing, uh, mathematics, even learning a sport. It all takes patience. And it's patience that brings maturity. What if we went back to the old dial-up internet? I don't know if you can use old and internet in the same sentence, but you remember the... And you would wait for this connection, and nobody would go for that anymore. It's way too slow. Remember when you downloaded a picture? and it would go pixel line by pixel line, and in about five to 10 minutes you had some of the picture, uh, and that's just, nobody says, hey, why don't we go back to the old dial-up? Nobody does that. Why not? Because we are so enamored with getting things done right now. I don't know, there's something not right with my computer at home, and if I'm on a website, I, I wanna be able to be on a new website in less than five seconds. Is that too much to ask? You know that, but we are very impatient when it comes to, uh, comes to the world. I, I recently, uh, over the pandemic, took up woodworking as a hobby. And I'll tell you, that, that teaches you patience. Because I'm the kind of guy where if I start a project today, I want to finish the project today. But here's what I've learned. When you rush things, it's not a might. You will make mistakes. And you know what happens in life when we rush things? We make mistakes all the time. James says, as was read this evening, but let patience have its perfect result that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. To, to be spiritually mature, it's going to take time. And I think that's one of the things we need to understand and appreciate with immature Christians. And I use that term in contrast to those that are more mature, not necessarily about age, takes time, takes time. And, and sometimes we expect newer Christians to always say the right thing. We expect newer Christians to know all the answers. Hey, God's working on them just like He's working on you. Patience brings maturity. It's like going on a vacation. And I'll tell you, vacations today are not like vacations when I was a kid. None of this GPS stuff. Remember the Rand McNally's? We had one of those in the glove box. We pull it out, trying to figure out where you're at. But at the very first stoplight, the kids in the back, are we there yet? Are we there? And that's just all you hear the whole trip. Be patient. That's what brings maturity. And that's what's, what's true about all acts of the Christian walk. Faith. Building your faith takes patience. And i got to tell you, you're going to learn many hard lessons before you have a rock-solid faith. And I mean hard lessons. Your knowledge of God's Word, well, first of all, you got to read it. God's not going to zap you and you suddenly know it inside and out. Studying takes patience. Uh, the reason brother so-and-so knows their scriptures so well is because they've been in it. I have to have patience. And that will bring maturity. Like learning to ride a bike. You're going to scrape your knees and do a couple of face plants before you master it. God is not in a hurry. So don't, don't rush His plan. If you have your Bibles, if you turn into Genesis chapter 15. Genesis 15. And I want to read just a, a few verses here. Genesis 15 and verse 5. Genesis 15, 5 reads... And he, meaning God, took him, meaning Abram, outside and said, Now look toward the heavens and count the stars, if you are able to count them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. Then he believed in the Lord, and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. Well, we know the promises that God has just given to Abram, that he would be the father of a great nation, and that he would have descendants as many as the stars. And Abram believed in the Lord. He trusted that God would make good on his promises. But look how chapter 16 starts. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. 
and she had an Egyptian maid whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, Now behold, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children through her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. And after Abram had lived ten years in the land of Canaan, Abram's wife Sarai took Hagar the Egyptian, her maid, and gave her to her husband Abram as his wife. And he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her sight. (coughs) Pardon me. Abram had been promised a son. God promised him a son. But it does appear that Abram wanted that son right now. I will say it seems like Sarai pushed him into it, maybe a little bit. But Abram takes this other wife, Hagar, and she bears a son for him. But that wasn't the promised son. That's not what God had intended. Abram jumped the gun. Well, what about Moses? You know, Moses Moses killing the Egyptian? Well, he was thinking that he was helping out his brethren. Years later in the wilderness, God told him to speak to the rock. Do you remember what he did? He did the old two-hander. He had his staff, uh, and, and he just cracked that rock as hard as he... Now, he got water. He got water. But do you remember from that little stunt? He was not allowed to enter the promised land. Don't rush God's plan. He's not in a hurry. Look what David wrote in Psalm 32. Do not be as the horse or as the mule. Horses and mules can be polar opposites. Uh, I remember at camp many years ago, I was riding this beautiful horse named Eve, and she wanted to go. Even when we were stopped, she wanted to go. It's just like the Kentucky Derby, right? Horses want to run. But you know something I've never seen entered into the Kentucky Derby? A mule. No one says, and on the mule in number three lane, no one says that. Nobody rides a mule. Why? Well, we've heard the expression stubborn as a mule. It's because if if you can get them going, if you can, good luck. Don't be like the horse that wants to jump ahead of everything, but don't be like the mule who doesn't want to go anywhere. It's not always easy to wait upon the Lord. And oftentimes we think we know a better way, we know a faster way, a shortcut. We are a nation of finding shortcuts. That's what we like to do. It's not always easy to wait upon the Lord. I think one of the biggest problems for Christians is that we walk by sight and not by faith. We are told to walk by faith and not by sight. God assures us that If we allow ourselves to be used by Him, He'll use us. However, we can't always see God working behind the scenes. We don't always see what's going on behind the scenes, even though He is. Give you an example. How many wars did you read about in the Old Testament? Constant, wasn't it? turnover, fighting, everything else. Can God accomplish His purpose through such unpeaceful means? He did and He does. He did and He does. We can't see God working behind the scenes. How many years do you think Peter was pulling nets thinking that this is what he's going to do the rest of his life? I'm just going to be a fisherman. I accept that. What was God doing all that time? He was training Peter so that he could become a fisher of men. What about Ruth? Ruth is an amazing story, but remember that she was a widowed woman who moved to a strange land. What she had essentially done is hit the reset button. She's starting over. But remember this, if Ruth had not gone through loss and suffering, she would have never met Boaz. You know what that means? there be no David. Do you know what that means if there's no David? There's no Jesus. God in His plan, even through suffering, He works behind the scenes in the lives of people. We can't see everything that God is doing in our lives, and that's why we walk by faith and not by sight. Remember the Exodus. 
the Israelites. Finally, finally after that tenth plague, they were marching to freedom, no more slavery. They, they, they were done working for these Egyptians. And as they left the city, they were all smiles. Exodus 14.8 says, the sons of Israel were going out boldly. You know how I picture that? I think they were strutting. I think they were just, you're not whipping me anymore. And they're just kind of... This, when the Israelites get to the Red Sea, though, their tune changes a little bit. And don't think that it's like they were going to the beach. I think sometimes we get, oh, they went to the shore. Oh, that's neat. I like sunsets type of deal. As Israel came to the Red Sea, the Bible goes to great lengths telling us that it was kind of an eerie feeling. Most of those Israelites, remember, they were, they were only familiar maybe with the Nile River. Probably none of them or very few of them had ever seen the sea. There was this strange darkness. There was a, a howling wind. I mean, it was a very scary atmosphere. And, and when Israel saw all of this, what did they think? They thought God had abandoned them. When in fact, the Bible says He was in the wind. He was in the darkness. God was in there, even though it didn't look like it. We have to have complete trust in Him, despite what we see. Now, I, I've said this enough times uh, at our home congregation. People are probably sick of me saying it. But uh, when I say it, I know not everyone's going to do it, because you can't change people. As much as you try. Brethren, stop watching so much news. Stop watching so much news. I can read the headlines of the world. Whether it's COVID, whether it's the economy. You know, someone joked the other day, uh, they, they put on uh, Facebook, I guess it was, that uh, my wife and I just got approved for a loan, we can now buy a tank of gas. <laughs> when we look at all that is going on around us, when we look at Europe, we look at the struggles that this world just seems to be going through, sometimes we run around like chicken little with our head cut off. The sky is falling. The sky is falling, believing the worst. Regardless of what the news tells you, here is the main headline every day. God is in control. And until we accept that, we'll never stop worrying. Until the next headline, then the next headline, then the next one. God is in control. When we forget that, that's when we start to waver. When we walk by what we see, of course we're going to be troubled. So walk by faith, knowing that our Lord has promised, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. We don't know what's going on behind the scenes. Take old Jacob, for example. Well, in Jacob's mind, he had already lost his son Joseph to a tragic uh, event with an animal. His son Simeon is being held hostage back in Egypt. And now... And now his boys want to take his favorite son, Benjamin, back into Egypt. Jacob says in Genesis 42, verse 36, all these things are against me. Jacob, nothing's against you. Actually, everything is going very well for you. But he couldn't see that. He couldn't see God working behind the scenes. When things seem to be crashing down all around us, how do we know that all things are against us? You can't make an omelet without breaking some eggs. God isn't in a hurry. And just like the Exodus, sometimes God is in that fierce wind. Sometimes He's in the eye of the hurricane. Sometimes He's in that darkness. And another thing, when we pray, we need to have patience. We, we seem to think that just because God doesn't grant us our petitions when we pray that that's a no. That's not always the case. 
God's delays are not God's denials. God isn't in a hurry. He's not trying to build Rome in a day. You ever been on an airplane or a boat and you say to yourself, I cannot wait until I get off this thing and step on solid ground. How did old Noah feel, do you think? Were any of his family seasick? God told Noah, I want you to build a boat because I am going to destroy this world with a flood. What's interesting with the flood account, something that we pay very little attention to, are the times that God gives us throughout that account. For example, Noah's told to build the ark. God's going to bring the animals to him, and then Noah would get them on board. God tells Noah, make sure you got enough food for your family. Make sure you got enough food for the animals. And in chapter 7, verse 4, God tells him, after seven more days, I will send rain on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. Do you know how long Noah and his family were on the ark? Over a year. Over a year. Could you live in a barn? Because that's essentially what it was, a floating barn. Could you live in a barn for over a year? Did you also know there's no text where God told Noah how long it was going to be? After the water stopped from the 40 days of rain, it says that after... 150 days, the water decreased. That's five months. Then the ark rested on the mountains of Ararat. Noah's got to be thinking, how much longer am I going to, you know, this woodpecker's getting, making me nervous here. Then a couple months later, the tops of the mountains could be seen. Forty days after that, Noah sends out a raven, and it just keeps flying, leaving, coming back, leaving, and coming back. Then he sends out a dove. It returns. A week later, sends out the dove again, and it comes back with the olive branch. He waited another week, sent the dove out, and she didn't return. And that's when Noah looks out the window. Remember, there's that one window. I, 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 we always say square. We just always assume windows are square. Um, but he, he looks out the window, and it says Noah could no longer see any water. That's a good sign, right? Can't see any water. Two months after that, God says, okay, now you can get off the ark. I would think all through that process, all through that time, over a year, Noah was, he had to have been praying for dry land. Probably a you know, after the 40 days of rain, all right, when do we get off this boat? But it took a while. God's delays are not God's denials. I was rifling through some of my old sermons last week, and I, I came upon this. This is something that, uh, that I said in a sermon back in July of 2009. So here's what I said, quote, We're going to have children one day. That's not an I hope, that's an I know. God hasn't denied us children, He's just delaying it. I don't know why. In a few weeks, we'll have been married for nine years, but maybe for Him to make us the kind of parents we need to be, maybe it takes nine years. End of quote. As it turns out, it took 10 years until we got Maverick. 21 years until we got Paisley. When we ask for patience, what we have to understand is that learning patience is submitting to the will of God. I don't know why you're doing things this way, Lord, but I just put my life in your hands. Patience is not easily learned. God tests us. God tries us. And the only way we can really learn patience is to surrender to Him and let Him have His way. God can grow a mushroom overnight, but He takes years to grow an oak tree. Things that are worth something are worth the wait as they grow. You look at the great men and women of the Bible and see if there wasn't a waiting period. See if there wasn't a time of testing 
in which God was training them up and training them up with hardships. You, you look, at, uh, look at Joseph, just a kid when he was sold into slavery. It took him 13 years to get anywhere in the house of Egypt, becoming the prime minister. That included jail time. Do you realize that in order for Moses to lead the Israelites out of slavery, it took the Lord 80 years to mold Moses into the type of leader that God needed him to be? God, or Moses only led Israel for 40 years, but it took him 80 years to get ready to do it. Kind of like preparing a sermon or a Bible class. The hours that go into it, but when it's presented, it only takes 30, 40 minutes. Thanksgiving dinner, right? For some people, it takes days to prepare, and it's gobbled up in 20 minutes. But think about Moses. After the first 40 years of Moses' life, he still wasn't ready to lead. You know what was involved in Moses' first 40 years of life? Education, right? He was as educated as you could be in that time. But even after 40 years of hardcore Egyptian education, he still wasn't ready to lead. He was too impulsive. He went and killed this Egyptian. 40 years wasn't enough. He needed another 40 years of what? Being a shepherd then he would be ready to lead. You want to do a good study? Study the shepherds of the Bible. And you know what you're going to find? You're going to find what I would call the heavy hitters. You're going to find the people that you wouldn't expect for God to use, but he used them and he starts them in a field watching sheep. What about King David? Anointed as king at a very young age, even though he wouldn't get the crown for many more years. What was God doing with David? All through that time, he was getting them ready. Those several years that David was on the run from King Saul, that was training. The days he spent in the field watching his father's sheep, he was training. That's all preparation that God is having him do. God doesn't hurry it up when it comes to developing his people, even his own son, Jesus. We read about him in Luke's gospel when he was 12. How young Jesus amazed the rulers and teachers. But you know, at age 12, Jesus still wasn't ready for what God needed him to do. Jesus didn't even begin his ministry until he was around 30. So after that account of Jesus in the temple, there's 18 years that we know nothing about other than he was a carpenter. Why did Jesus begin his ministry at age 30? Because that's how long it took. That's how long it took to get things ready. And during his ministry, Jesus wasn't in a hurry to get things done. How many times did he say, my hour has not yet come? Back in the beginning, God could have created everything in the blink of an eye. But for reasons we don't know, he created the world in six days. He's not in a hurry. In Hebrews 6 and verse 12, that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherited the promises. God doesn't always explain what He's doing, nor does He explain why He's doing it. And you know what? He doesn't have to. He's God. We have the promise of eternal life sitting right there in front of us, but we got to be patient. It will come. It's like an injury or maybe a surgery. If you don't wait the time that you need to in order to heal, you're going to backtrack. You're going to do some more damage. You have to have patience with how God is developing you. The promise is always going to be there. And through faith, through patience, we will get there. Someone once asked, why did God make me this way? Why did God make me this way? Well, that's just the thing. God didn't make you. God is making you. He's not done with you yet. However old you are, you are not the finished product yet. Whether you're a seasoned old Christian like Bill or you're a young whippersnapper like Lily, it takes time to take that chunk of clay and mold it into a piece of pottery. In fact, we sing the song, Mold me and make me after thy will. That's what he's doing 
with each and every one of his children, regardless of your age. And we all got some imperfections that we got to work on in our lives and fix. But I'll tell you, problems take time to fix. I remember a wise old preacher, he said this, and the context was he was talking about those that are going through marital problems. And he was talking about how the common misnomer is that a couple that is going through marital problems, well, they just need to take a course and that it's all done. They're all, you know, everything's back to normal. But he said this, he said, it takes just as long to get to McDonald's as it does to get home from McDonald's. There's wisdom in that. A lot of the things that you and I have to fix in our lives are going to take some time. But we need to have patience with even that. Sometimes we sacrifice quality just so we can get it done right away. God isn't governed by time. He's not in a hurry. We need to look by faith to God and let Him have His way in His time. He makes all things beautiful in His time. He's not in a hurry. I'd like you to turn to the hymn of encouragement, or it's going to be up on the screen in just a moment. But we always offer heaven's invitation. But I I hope this evening, if there isn't anyone here that wants to obey the gospel, Have your sins washed away in the waters of baptism? The majority of us have already done that. But I want you to think about the things that that you have in your life, your little to-do lists, your little to-do lists. Whether you are one that uh, maybe you're a little OCD, like uh, some in my household, and you have to write everything down, you know, checklist. We're getting ready to go on vacation. Ashley has her checklist. We got to get all these things done first. Or maybe you're one of those just has the checklist in your mind. I'm going to make a suggestion. When you have that checklist mentality, always make sure that there's some important things on your checklist. And what I mean by that is, yeah, you probably do need to go to the grocery store. Or you need to get this fixed or you need to take the car in or whatever it may be. But don't forget things on your to-do list like, I need to read my Bible. I need to go to my father in prayer. I need to call so-and-so or brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so. See how they're doing. Encourage them. Be patient. Be patient. That crown is waiting. And we all have loved ones we can't wait to see. But I hope, more than all of that, that when we draw our last breath, our mind is on our Savior that we will be with for eternity. Heaven is our hope, but be patient. Let's stand and sing this last song.
this is the opportunity when anybody who needs to, to partake of the Lord's Supper can do so. Anytime we th take of the Lord's Supper, one of the verses that ought to come to our mind is this John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. We are the world, that, that's what the verse is referring to. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. He that believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. If you think about this, we're celebrating the death and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's offer thanks for the bread. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you loved us so much that you gave your only Son to come to this earth and go to the cross, give his life, that we might have hope for that eternal rest when this life is over. Be with those who partake of this bread tonight that they will truly remember your son and what he did for them. In your son's name, amen. Let's offer thanks for the fruit of the vine. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blood that your son shed on Calvary's cross. This blood is what cleanses us from our sins. We would pray that those who partake this evening would remember this incident. Forgive us of their sins and in uh, in death save us in Jesus name Amen Thank you for your presence here this evening for our evening service. This brings the end of the service. Um, on Wednesday, by God's grace, we shall meet to have our Bible studies. And let us remember all those who are sick and those whose names were put on the, on the board uh, this morning. Uh, if it is possible, shall we humbly uh, stand as we offer our last prayer? Heavenly Father, we humbly bow before you as we come to the close of this service and near the end of another day that you've given us. We know, Heavenly Father, that each day is a gift from you, not only each day, but everything that we have is a gift from you. Heavenly Father, as we go out into the world, we know that there'll be days that we have trials and tribulations. And it may not be tomorrow, it may not be even this week, but we know there'll be days that come. And Heavenly Father, we pray for patience and endurance when our faith is tested. Heavenly Father, we pray for strength to keep ourselves straight and walking by your side and Heavenly Father, we pray for the wisdom to seize any opportunity we may have as we go out into the world and the people we're around, we may help them in any chance we get. Heavenly Father, as we leave this place now, we ask that you'll keep us safe, look over us, and safely return us when we meet here once again. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat>